All right, welcome. It's great to have everybody here. I'm super excited because I'm one a bit abnormally born, came around a whole lot later, almost 30 years old when I was baptized into Christ, and missed a lot of the really, you know, kind of cool, interesting history that uh, a lot of you all experienced, uh, at least some of you, as I look across the ages in, in the crowd today. But history has, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, been an extremely important part of our faith, because unlike any other construct of philosophy under heaven, we are unique in Christianity. And, and why is that? Because what holds us together, what energi energizes us, what delivers us is not some sort of tenant of philosophy, but a historical event. And thus, we are a people of history, a historical event. And that historical event is that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And thus, the book of Acts begins exactly with that very idea. Not only the ascension of Christ, but as we've read already in, in uh, Acts chapter 1, many convincing proofs that Jesus rose from the dead. Everything hangs on that. And, and as it is the, the, the central tenet of, of what it is that we believe, you know, Paul even later will go on to say that, that this historical event is of, of such import that this is the essence, the very essence of what we preach, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he, that he was buried and that he rose. He rose from the grave. Now, again, this is like so familiar stuff to us that it, there's contempt with familiarity, right? But we can't let that be the case. We, we've got to be realized like, no, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And when you believe that, all bets are off. And how is it that these 11, then 12 fellas went from doubting vacillators to world-changing, bold preachers. It's because they were convinced of that simple historical fact. Jesus rose from the dead. And more importantly, that all of history was coming to that very point in time. All of Jewish history was coming to a culmination of that redemptive act of Jesus dying for our sins according to the scriptures, being, uh, being buried and, and raising on the third day according to the scriptures. All of it came to that. And not just that, but all of world history came together. Galatians 4.4 says at just the right time, at just the right time, Jesus Christ was born. Born under the law, born of a virgin at just the right time. And, and we know from the kingdom study, right, the, the, the wonders of history and the six centuries of, of God manipulating masterfully as a, as a puppeteer the, the likes of Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and Alexander the Great and Caesar Augustus, right? I mean, to the rest of the world, that's the essence of Western Civ. That, that's the kind of the, the hallmarks that, that really mark all of history. And we realize that those are nations that are a rounding error because they're just dust on the scales or a drop in the bucket. Because all of that history all funnels into the main history that is ours. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus. Jesus is the new king. Jesus is the inauguration of the kingdom that all of this is really the case. And so as Stephen begins to preach to the, the Sanhedrin and brings it with such just, you know, I mean, enthusiasm coming like smoke out of his ears in front of these guys. I mean, the most intimidating 70 folks that could gather him in there into that crucible, and there he is standing firm as, as they are all blown back by not only his great mastery of their history, but also realizing that this history means nothing. None of it before, none of it later, without Jesus. And so our history as well. But, but as he begins to preach to them, look over in, uh, in Acts chapter 7. We see this famous image 
when the members of the Sanhedrin, I'm in verse 34, or no, 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious, gnashed their teeth at him, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. We know the rest of the story. They weren't too happy with that. Kind of acted like all of your kids do when they don't want to hear what it is that you're saying in that moment. No, 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 no. Stone him. And, and the silly, I mean, the silliness of that scene. But what is really captured by the Holy Spirit for us to read there, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, I know we like to say he's giving him a standing ovation. I've, I've probably preached that more times than anybody ever should have. Uh, but, but you know what I'm doing? I'm taking my own sensibilities and my own cultural understanding and, and importing it back into that passage. Because, you know, today a standing ovation is, yeah, is something that we do. Uh, but, but in a court, a royal court, as the scene is, is here, that really what that seems to be is not a standing ovation, but, but it is an advocate. An advocate that is now going to the Father and is an active advocation of Stephen for up and against all of the Sanhedrin. And what Stephen realizes is, yeah, you may be yelling and you may be getting ready to stone me, but at the very moment that you're doing that, I have an advocate that is standing up for me and is now making his case for me. And why did Jesus ascend? Well, one of the reasons is, is so that he could make intercession for transgressors. For every one of us. And, and, and throughout all of our history, and Andy's going to take us through an amazing run of history, but, it, but it's not just simply a narrative history, it's an anal analysis of our history as well. But, but as we see the kind of the vicissitudes and the, 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 the greatness and, and even the failings in our own history, and, and my goodness, what church in the New Testament doesn't have that, realize what did Jesus die and ascend for? But so that he could always be making intercession for us. And whether that graph is going up or that graph is going down, guess what? Either way, Jesus is still making intercession for every one of us. That's such an amazing, comforting feeling. He's not standing for Stephen because of his own righteousness. He's standing for Stephen because Stephen needs an advocate and Stephen needs Jesus' righteousness. And, and so do every one of us. There's not a new covenant that's initiated suddenly here. We all have the righteousness of Christ in all of our fumbling and bumbling and stumblings of trying to be church leaders. But, but throughout the history that has come and the, the history that we now make, know that no matter what, as we go forward and make this history, Jesus is standing for you. Yeah. Let me turn it over to Andy. Thank you, Ed. Knowing our history, uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, place where to begin. I just want to... Uh, say that really our history began as a church 2,000 years ago. And if we really believe that, then we can't pretend or act like nothing happened between the year, you know, 30 A.D. and 1979. Okay? That, there's something a little faulty in that argument. And uh, what's interesting is sometimes we act that way, and yet... In many of the Christian countries that we do our work in, I've had the privilege, I actually think it's a privilege to work in many sort of unchristian countries. Uh, there's some advantages to that. There's some disadvantages too. Uh, raising elders out of pure heathenism is absolutely more challenging uh, than uh, going into some kind of Christian community and getting some people who've already been kind of with the program for a while. But uh, I'd like to look at a biblical principle to start with. Simply, there's nothing new under the sun. And uh, in 2,000 years of church history, we have to understand we're not the first people to want to go back to the Bible. We're not the first people that just want to approach God as simply as possible, uh, not, not by any means. But the fact is, because of all of our own histories and our experiences, 
it's hard for us to see what that actually means. Like, it's hard for us to see, see it more deeply. And uh, I love this verse in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. Paul says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should be careful how he builds. And he goes on to talk about your, your building's going to be tested, whatever you do. Uh, anyone feel like their building's been tested? Okay, well, good. I, well, the first thing I just want to say is the foundation still stands. Okay, nothing's wrong with the foundation. It's just as strong as it ever was. But the building has, interestingly, God allows us to participate in that building. We're co-workers with him. And as an, as a, an effect, the building has some characteristics of ours as well, not just divine ones based on its foundation. I'm going to zip through some church history because uh, I want us just to have a context, and, I, and I'm going to go quickly through it. But I want us to understand something. Again, our movement, as we call it, didn't arise in a vacuum. And there were many factors at play. Uh, and, and as with everything in life, there's almost no circumstance that doesn't have a good side and a bad side. You know, there, there's, there's just there's difficulties. There's no human characteristic that doesn't have a plus and a minus. There's no human talent that doesn't have a negative side or a positive side. You know what I'm saying? So it's important to understand that as we look back and uh, consider this history. Um, if I can get my slide to go. Doesn't want to go. Okay, one second. There we go. Uh, you know, just, um, oh, I missed, I missed the beginning. The apostolic church, okay. Uh, the church spread in the lifetime of the apostles pretty much through the known world. We don't have uh, great resources to understand exactly what happened, mainly because the church wasn't of interest to most people. Uh, the first century was in many ways kind of idyllic. Uh, it was kind of tough for the Christians in Rome at one point. Uh, Nero wanted a scapegoat, so he blamed it on the Christians. Uh, but there wasn't really a great negativity towards the Christianity. In fact, it was considered by most uh, a Jewish sect, and that actually gave it a fair bit of flexibility and freedom. But we just have a list here of the you know, various apostles and uh, traditionally where they went so we can see that they were actually going out into the whole world. Uh, Ephesians 2.19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Initially, these, these were individuals. They, they hadn't written anything down yet. And building on the apostles was building on their teaching. Of course, in their teaching, Jesus was the cornerstone. And, uh, you know, this analogy gets manipulated in various ways. Paul talked about Jesus himself being the foundation. But when it came to building the church, even in the laying of the foundation, there's human activity. And even as church builders, we lay a foundation not simply by giving someone a Bible, but it's by training them and teaching them and modeling for them what it means to be a Christian. So in the first century, the church expanded. All evidence uh, points uh, tells us that. There's no question about it. Uh, but the church really itself wasn't, no, wasn't any great uh, power in the world. Uh, we have in the first century into the middle of the second century, uh, what was known as the Apostolic Fathers, and these are some additional writings. Really not much. We have much more in the New Testament than we have right here, and this would be in the 70 years, say, following the New Testament. So there's, there's not a whole much more information, but, but what is interesting is, except for Ignatius, who already began to speak of a single bishop leading a group of elders, which is interesting. He was the first one to name that. And uh, then... Maybe it would be um, the Didash talks about uh, baptizing somebody three times, once in the name of the Father, once in the name of the Son, once in the name of the Holy Spirit. I mean, yeah, whatever it takes, okay? Uh, but uh, maybe that's where three's a charm came from, I don't know. But, but what's interesting is there's some deviations that came up, but, but there wasn't any kickback. We don't have any information to tell us what's really going on in the churches, except that the message of the apostles and their writings are beginning to be distributed. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of theology, theological thinking that says, like the New Testament 
was written late, etc. But if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul says the scriptures say, and there he quotes Deuteronomy and Luke chapter 10 in 1 Timothy. And if you look at 1 Timothy, he says, I've left you in Ephesus, and I'm coming back to see you in Ephesus. We know from Acts 20, Paul never returned to Ephesus itself. He, he told them, I'll never see you again. So 1 Timothy had to be written sometime before the end of Acts 20. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, I don't know about what the theologians are going to say. I just know what my Bible tells me. So uh, it's a pretty simple way to approach it. But, but we look at the scriptures and we understand that already Peter wrote in 2 Peter that people are distorting Paul's letters just as they do the other scriptures. And then he actually references that God's patience leads to salvation, which absolutely looks back at Romans chapter 2, verse 4. So there's connections, interconnections in the New Testament, and I just don't want anyone to doubt that that's not what the first century church and second century church was built on. Uh, we move into the second, third and centuries. We begin to have uh, what materializes is apologists who wanted to sort of argue with the Greek philosophers of the day. And you don't have to worry about taking pictures of this. I'll put it on wherever the website's going to be, uh, the, the PowerPoint. You can take, you can take it, okay? Um, but here's, again, the church is expanding. It's growing. It's beginning to interact with Greek culture at a more official thing. Uh, you have certain Christians that want to, uh, they want to apologize in a, in a positive sense, defend what Christianity is. And uh, this begins a, a, a type of writing that we'll see in the uh, second and third centuries. Also, early church fathers. Uh, interestingly, Tertullian was the first one to introduce this idea of Trinitas. Uh, obviously, the three-form formula that's in the New Testament was used, though it's quite rare compared to the most often the scriptures speak about the Father and the Son, but occasionally there's three-form, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's quite rare. But uh, it's still evidence that people began to think about it. Tertullian was the first to sort of say this might be three persons, though actually he was, in, he was meaning more of three roles. Uh, a lot of theology wasn't yet defined. And that's what we end up seeing in, in the 4th to 6th centuries. Orthodoxy gets established. And uh, you can read this all later. Many of you know it already. But most of this orthodoxy was in response to heretical teaching. And it was confusion about who was Jesus, how does this work? And since they were using a lot of Greek philosophy in their terminology, uh, that led to actually some more confusion, not more clarity. Uh, and so anyways, as time went on, this became established. Christianity's granted full legal status. Uh, in 381, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. I mean, what a change of circumstance. Uh, the first council, the first the ecumenical council involving everyone actually was called by the emperor of Rome himself, Constantine. And as you can imagine, already that's tainting a little bit, just the purity of being Christians. Amen. And uh, a lot of that has to then to do with what happens with the development of creeds. And in the end, you even have creeds that uh, will say at the end, if you don't agree with us, anathema on you. I mean... It's crazy. That's powerful. That's saying basically be cursed and damned if you don't agree with us. So, so you know, this transition is a solidifying of Christian doctrine. Uh, there's many denominations today that accept this orthodoxy without even reflection. It's been so built into all Christian hermeneutic and understanding. But I think as serious students of the Bible, we need to reflect and understand something. Uh, why am I going to believe what these guys have developed in theology, when by the fourth century they're already baptizing infants. Uh, when they're teaching, as Augustine de as did at the beginning of the fifth century, that the, the church is really like God's kingdom on earth physically. The city of God describes uh, a view of the kingdom that basically is a spiritual Israel materialized and therefore justifies the church to have wealth and power, long as it's used correctly. But uh, we know how that goes, and history tells the story. So uh, there's a book I would like to recommend to you guys. It's called Discovering Our Roots, Ancestry, The Ancestry of the Churches of Christ, uh, ACU Press, 1988. And I, I'm going to take a little bit out of that just to, again, bring us up to date on what happened.
uh, the name of our class, we're, we're looking at reformation uh, and restoration, actually is the right word. We're looking at restoration. But honestly, what does that mean? What are we trying to restore? Uh, you know, many of us are trying to restore our bodies to what they were when we were 25. Well, <laughs> good luck with that, okay? Good luck with that. Uh, you just got to learn to enjoy to watch the next generation <laughs> abuse their 25-year-old bodies and not appreciate what really uh, awesome thing they have. But, but the point is, we want a restoration uh, in our minds about going back simply to be disciples of Jesus who are following the scriptures. Uh, when I'm just talking in theological circles, I, I describe myself as a biblical theist. In other words, someone who believes in God as described in scripture. And then uh, I, my mode of Christianity, I see myself as a second generation Christian. I'm not a first generation Christian. We can't go back and be first generation Christians. They had eyewitnesses to Jesus himself. Uh, they, they experienced uh, signs and wonders uh, as an affirmation of the preaching that it was true. I mean, they had a different experience, and there was an evolution already taking place. Even during the writing of the Bible, the New Testament, there's an evolution taking place. But we're in a different mode. We are the receivers of what was given in that first generation. And we believe that on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the church today can be built. Amen? So some of the, uh, uh, what, what really led to what we call restoration is the Reformation. Uh, the Dark Ages, the 5th to 6th, then to 10th centuries. What's interesting, this is the European perspective of these centuries. Uh, the Muslims talk about this as the Golden Ages. <laughs> now, actually, if you understand what was going on, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, what wasn't going so well for most of Europe was going pretty good, well for the Muslim expansion in the world at that time. Uh, but in the uh, beginning of the 14th century, 1300, um, there was a renaissance in thinking. And uh, what happened was uh, economies began to improve enough, there began to be a little bit more time, and people began to reflect and think a little bit more about what happened to the great Roman Empire, what happened to the history, the Greek Empire. And so uh, people began to think again about what's really going on in their lives. And, and this was called humanism, where people began to return to the ancient Greek philosophers and, the, and Roman law and started to read these things and really look for a sort of revitalization. And this had its effect in Christianity. Uh, Christians began to think about this as well. But as you can imagine, uh, in the 14th century, almost all education was controlled by the Catholic Church in Europe. And most of the institutions of education had to do with preparing people for the Catholic ministry. And, uh, you know, basically all of Europe was Catholic. There was a few outlying areas, but for the most part, it had been uh, Christianized. Uh, we go a little further. Uh, the Reformation begins at the late 1400s. Certain Catholic priests, they're the first ones to, to actually call it. The, the Reformation began through the, the desire of Catholic priests who weren't satisfied with, what, with where the church was at. And so they called for Reformation. We have Luther in Germany, Zwingli uh, in uh, Switzerland, Calvin also in Switzerland, and, uh, and a lot of developments. And, and just you know some simple things, because these are the men that began to give to give meaning to this word reformation and then restoration. Um, for, for Luther, reformation was reform and purify the historic institutional church while at the same time preserving as much of the tradition as possible. Uh, he really didn't want to just call it a blank slate and start over. Uh, Luther was really a reformer and he was really the first one to voice clearly these sentiments and he was the first one to effectively uh, really make a stand against the Catholic Church in a way that would actually lead others. So he, he focused on how to find forgiveness of sins, and he didn't see the scriptures as a blueprint for how the church could be. He sort of accepted the church in its general forms as being okay, as being enough. But there was a content he wanted to change, and that was the teaching of forgiveness and about grace. And uh, 
just next door is Wingley, who was in Switzerland. He was insisting that Scripture be the exclusive source of all judgment. And Luther didn't agree with him about that. And uh, we, we look at uh, then Zwingli. Uh, he wanted to restore the essence and form of the primit primitive church based on biblical precedent and example. And for the most part, ignore tradition. So he sought to reform the institutions of the church, tended to see in the Bible a normative pattern for all aspects of church life. What's interesting is he had some followers who wanted to take it further. And uh, when, when the idea of baptizing infants came up, uh, sorry, baptizing adults and, and stopping to baptize infants, Zwingli was completely against it because he wanted still a connection. He wanted the church to be connected in government. And so he stood against that. And uh, uh, then we had the beginning of the Annie, uh, Anabaptist movement, and they were persecuted and even killed by the new Protestants, not just the Catholics. And, you know, there's a hundred-year war that takes place in all of this. Sadly, uh, this was a tough time in the church. Uh, we see here an important contrast between Reformation and Restoration. And so in what was called the Reformation movement, there's already sort of a tension. What is, what needs to be reformed? What needs to be restored? How much needs to be got, gotten rid of? And, and the truth is, it's these questions and how you answer them that resulted in a multiplicity of denominations. Because it's all about how much you're willing to change and how much you're willing to go back to Scripture. Um, I won't talk about... Uh, more people, but there, there are more people that were important in, um, in driving this Reformation further. John Calvin's probably most important in that he was a systematic theologian, and he really tried to put all the pieces together. Uh, it's some heavy reading, but he's got a few big, thick volumes of his uh, theology. And, uh, of course, he had a lot of influence then on the Protestant movement, and uh, came up with some conclusions, some conclusions that we would find completely counterintuitive about predestination and how free will works and how God's will is manifest. So, you know, but that's very influential in what happened in, in the Reformation. Uh, then there's what's going on in England. Uh, and I talk about this simply. England had a very different story. Where, whereas all the other Protestant groups sort of began with a theological point, uh, Henry VIII just wanted a divorce. And uh, he just wanted to fix his marital status and get an heir, right? So, uh, so the, the Anglican Church's actual break from Catholicism wasn't based on any great uh, theological position. It was uh, based really on one man's need. And, and so what happened then was this break with the Anglican, the, the Anglican Church gave birth to more denominations than almost any other of these Protestant groups because everyone was trying to figure out the theology afterwards. And uh, one of the most influential groups that came out of it was the Puritans. And the Puritans, again, were saying, let's go back to Scripture. Let's, let's figure out what it just means to be a Christian. They were, there was so much corruption in the organization uh, that they wanted to simply go back and and the Anglican Church would say, well, Scripture's just one source of how the church should, should be built, but not the only source. So there were Puritans who wanted to separate. Uh, actually, the tension got so great that this is what drove the Puritans to, to look to America as colonists and move over there and begin basically New England. So what's interesting, too, is the, the Puritan movement also believed that if if, if God was on your side, he'd bless the nation. And they actually got to a point, those people that got on the Mayflower and came over actually believed they were going to escape condemnation from God. If they stayed in England, God was actually going to rain down judgment on England. So they actually believed they were fleeing, and the new, land, the new, the, the new world then, of course, was this new opportunity of uh, finding a, a true way to worship God. Um, these uh, early uh, Puritans had influence on the people that then influenced the Campbells, both Thomas and Alexander, which we'll see are, are people very significant in our, our history. So uh, the Baptists were one of the spin-offs that came from the Puritans emerging at the end of the 1500s. So 
Now we come to North America, the setting of early American nationhood. And, you know, the idealism of coming to America was great. Um, it's hard for a Canadian to say that, but yes, it's true. Uh, but uh, five points that, that could be noticed uh, that, they, that, that Hughes uh, noticed in, in his book is the Edenic, the Edenic quality of America inspired dreams and of renewal. Like, it was, it was just this open territory. No one had messed up yet. No one had polluted yet. Uh, American democracy was thought to be of God. I won't even touch that one. Millennial <laughs> expectation that the golden age was near. Okay? You know, there's always, in these times of renewal, there's a little bit of sense that the end may be coming. Uh, and that's part of the impetus. Freedom from the old world traditions and state-run churches and the assurance associated with returning to a primitive faith. All this had to do with an idealism. And the, the Puritans brought that with them. Uh, you know, and so there, there's a lot more history there. It's good to follow it. Uh, the Baptist, again, reemerged out of the Puritans and another strain of the Baptist. This became a very powerful uh, movement in the United States. And uh, what began in New England basically moved down uh, into the southern United States, and that's where it really uh, gained a stronghold. And so uh, the separate Baptists, and, and, and the sad thing is, as you look through all this history, there's just division upon division upon division. But every time someone divides, the reason is because we're going to go back and follow the, B, the Bible more carefully, more exactly. And so I want us to understand something, that uh, this is an ongoing drive that just didn't emerge out of nowhere, you know, a few decades ago. Uh, this is something I believe that happens when anyone's in a situation where the, the, the church they're a part of, the fellowship they're a part of, it seems to be losing life, but they see something more in Scripture, and they want something more. And because they want something more, they begin to look for it. And, uh, and things begin to change. Um, so we, this brings us to the Restoration Movement. And uh, the, the few people that are named here, basically, uh, this is the beginning of non-denominationalism. But uh, what's interesting is it's hard to maintain non-denominationalism. Uh, it's almost a fallacy in itself. Either if you say, I'm a non-denomination, you're already just labeled yourself, so that's a denomination. Um, uh, but, but, it, but the goals are, are right, that this denominationalism is separating us. We, we need to get rid of those things that divide us. Okay, so uh, we come now to sort of the history. I'll slow it down just a little, but... Uh, this is part of our history. Uh, there were two Presbyterian ministers, and then actually the son of the second, that had great influence on beginning what we call the Restoration Movement in the United States. Uh, the first was Barton W. Stone. He's a pres Presbyterian minister, uh, and he wanted to break down the denominational tie, the, uh, divisions. And so he was saying, we need to be just Christians only. And he was calling people to come out of their denominations, their sects, and just to be Christians. Um, he was very committed to liberty, freedom. And uh, he thought of denominationalism as kind of a captivity for the Christian faith. And uh, he made a lot of converts. By 1811, he had 13,000 people uh, following him in the South. Um, the Stone Movement was restorationist. It focused on more on holy and righteous living than on the forms and structures of man-made traditions. And it was uh, as opposed to a proactive attempt to restore primitive uh, Christian practice, which was exactly what Alexander Campbell was doing, and, that, and that's who we come to. Thomas Campbell arrived in America, not after, not just a couple years after arriving, he got kicked out of the Presbyterian Church, uh, and uh, he basically uh, started to try to experiment with ways of building church again. He wrote this declaration and address uh, which was talking about how we need to exit the denominations and just be Christians only. And uh, his son, then Alexander, joined him. And Alexander is the one that really brought a lot of structure and leadership to this restoration movement. Um, he, was, uh, he was trained in uh, universities in uh, Ireland, Glasgow, uh, and Scotland. Uh, and he, he had this uh, very intellectual approach to the Bible, uh, and so he, uh, he looked at the Bible like it was just facts, 
and simply facts, and it was a matter of assembling the facts correctly, and then you'll have the right doctrine. And of course, there's some truth in that, but not every passage is just a fact in the sense that it's, 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 there's examples that are implementations of the facts, so to speak. And so you have to learn how to separate sort of what's an example and what is the principle. And uh, that also was a, was a, was a difficult thing uh, at that moment. But Campbell rejected some things, uh, holy kiss, deaconesses, communal living, foot washing, and uh, charismatic exercises. He said these things are non-essential, which basically means they're not going to be practiced in his church. Okay? And so uh, then he argued for congregational autonomy, a plurality of elders in each congregation, weekly communion, and the immersion for the remission of sins, and this, these are characteristics of the apostolic faith. So, uh, you know, we can see these are things we're familiar with that he's talking about. And, uh, okay, maybe congregational autonomy, not so much. A little more popular these days in the right context. But we understand he was trying to restore what he saw in the New Testament. Uh, it was systematic. It was rational. Um, it began to spread through Kentucky and through Tennessee, southern Ohio, and actually had great success in organizing Stone's people. Because Stone wasn't really about the organizational part, the form part. And uh, so he captured the attention of Stone's group because they were having a hard time standing against the denominations in, in their arguments. And Alexander Campbell was an amazing uh, debater. So he was able to really defend the faith and the scriptures and that really inspired people. So uh, this this ended up making a union, and um, the assurance and certainty of Campbell's teaching that baptism was by immersion for the remission of sins, that spoke to many people uh, in, in this part of the world. And there was a great success and, and a rate of conversions for uh, the Campbell movement. Um, we just go further. Uh, Campbell was afraid uh, of the common supposition that the Holy Spirit might work on men's hearts separate from the Bible. He never came out and said that's impossible, but his teaching tended to imply that. And it actually got materialized by others who, uh, like we're quoting this guy B.F. Hall, he says, I believe that the Holy Spirit exerts no influence on the heart of sinners over and above the word, that his influences are in the facts he has revealed in the gospel, the evidence by which he has confirmed these facts, and in the motives to obedience to pre uh, present in the scriptures of truth. Wow. I mean, that's an amazing statement, which basically says the Holy Spirit is restricted to working in the lives of people only through scripture. It's interesting, though I know that that was part of what the Church of Christ I grew up in uh, understood or, or believed. It, wasn't, it was never stated that clearly. It wasn't a doctrine that ever got um, reinforced strongly, but it was how people practice uh, their Christianity. It was, it was influential there. So, uh, you know, it's interesting with Campbell. Um, it, as Campbell grew older, his, his views changed. He, he got a little more laid back a little more accepting of maybe some variations on the theme. Uh, I'm not saying he gave up, I'm not saying he gave up uh, immersion, etc. But he, he, became a, he became a little less judgmental and trying to influence people. And what's interesting is he became a little more like what we understand the Christian churches to have inherited. And it was interesting, in one of my courses a few years back, uh, we read a book about Campbell written by the Christian church, not by a Church of Christ author. And what was so interesting was they have a complete, his glory years were his later years. Whereas interestingly, I grew up only hearing about what he taught sort of in his early years. And uh, so interestingly, uh, uh, he probably wouldn't have been welcome in the Churches of Christ in about 1900 uh, already. Uh, so there's another number of things happening, but uh, sadly, uh, the Churches of Christ ended up splitting, and uh, you had what then would be called the Disciples of Christ and the Churches of Christ, the Churches of Christ being much smaller at this time, uh, already being over a million in combined membership wow. by 1900. And so uh, it's interesting just to, to, to kind of look at this story, um, but uh, it was also kind of north and south,
the Church of Christ was predominantly in the south. The Christian Church was pre predominantly, the Disciples of Christ Christian Church, predominantly in the north. And uh, there's some economic factors, cultural factors. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting study, but it isn't just all about what people believed. The, the Civil War really laid a foundation for a lot of the division. Um, so the Restoration Movement, the Church of Christ, uh, they've assumed that they're a people with no history and no tradition. And their only roots lie in the Bible itself. I'm quoting directly from Hughes here. Yet Churches of Christ are heir to a long line of believers whose chief tradition has been their resistance to tradition. <laughs> okay? Uh, they're born of the Christian humanists of the 15th and 16th century. This tradition was refined by Reformed Protestants on the continent, by Puritans in both Old and New England, and finally by Baptists and others on the American frontier. So when this traditionalist, traditionless tradition finally took root among our forebears, it already had a long and venerable history. You know, the problem with saying that we don't follow tradition is then you don't even ask yourself any critical question about do I have tradition in my practice of Christianity. If you, if you're, if you believe you have no tradition, you're not even going to ask the question. Um, there's a very interesting article. It was published in... Uh, 1973, I happened to be 15 years old at the time, uh, Everett Ferguson, one of the most uh, well-known um, theologians in the traditional Church of Christ, his textbooks have been used by Oxford University and all around the world, a very, a very uh, well-known scholar for the early church fathers. But it's interesting because I read this article, and, I'm th uh, and I read this many years later, and I'm thinking, did we go to the same church? Because this is how he described the restoration principle. And though I think he's right here, this isn't the average understanding of it. The biblical ideal to be the New Testament church today, I think people would agree with that. But this was not meant to be a historical re uh, restoration, but to take the apostolic teaching about the church found in the New Testament as a model. This is difficult because this apostolic teaching is wrapped up in its history and can't be separated from it. In other words, not all practice in the New Testament was necessarily meant to be imitated, but the principles behind it were meant to be understood. Something was being put into practice. Um, and, and I like this comment. The first century church fell short of the apostolic standard. You know, back in 2003, I had a phone call. And uh, someone said, Andy, are we still the New Testament church? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, we are. But uh, we thought we were the Philippians, and we found out we we're the Corinthians. That's all. Uh, it's still first century. And uh, you got to make sure you don't idealize the scriptures in such a way that it's impossible to be a New Testament Christian. Uh, I look at the New Testament, and man, the church had some issues. The church had some serious issues. But we can see within those issues the ideal of following Christ. And that, of course, is what we're trying to restore. Uh, not the New Testament church as it was exactly, but the ideal of following Christ in the way that the apostles presented it to the disciples. Number two, to practice the undenominational unity of the church, neither union nor uniformity. And this, this is interesting. I, I like what uh, Ferguson says here. Neither federation, agreement to disagree. That's an interesting way to have unity. Let's just agree to disagree. Or to agree in opinions and details we're completely uniform with each other. Uh, e both of those attitudes actually fail in the end. Uh, this, there should be a solidarity and fellowship. The brotherhood should be organic. There's unity in Christ. And, and this is the acknowledgement of Ferguson. Failure to achieve this unity has been one of the principal criticisms of the restoration movement. Failure to implement an ideal does not invalidate the ideal. Okay, that's a legitimate statement. And you know what? We've, we've failed at a few things in our history. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that those things we were trying to do were bad things. Okay, and it's important to, to learn that lesson. And then finally, restoring man to the image of God. Alexander Campbell saw this as the aim of the plea, restoration of man's fellowship with God. This isn't about... Restoration is not the goal, it's the process. We're in a process of restoration, okay? Uh, what's interesting, I just made a comment. What, what did Andy Fleming believe about this, these three things? You know, when, 
I believed when I was 15 that I was part of a fully restored church. I'd grown up in the Churches of Christ. In fact, fifth generation Church of Christ. Uh, I believed uniformity was to be more expected than diversity. I expected to go to a church somewhere in another city and see exactly what I'd seen in my home congregation. Uh, my mission and my purpose were the same thing. I confused what I had to do for God with who I was becoming by God's grace. I couldn't separate those two things in my head, and I appreciate what uh, Ferguson was pointing out. You know, when we come to the birth of the Boston movement then, uh, this, this birth for the most part took part in among the churches of Christ, that's where it came from, not the disciples of Christ, though in the early days there was some interest and a few people did come over from the Christian church, disciples of Christ, but in 1967 there was a pilot program for campus ministries in the churches of Christ. And uh, this was sort of uh, not, to me not meant to be in opposition to the Christian colleges and universities that had been established, but it was meant to be another approach to evangelize and bring people in. And, and this wasn't just in, uh, um, in, in Crossroads. It wasn't just there. It actually, in Gainesville, it was also in some other places in the uh, United States. Uh, a good friend of my family's, his name was Stanley Ship. He was in St. Louis and uh, I went with him when I was 14 years old, 1972, to uh, Switzerland on a campaign where we went out on the street and shared our faith for six, seven hours every day. Wow. Okay, that, that's what, that was another branch of this. But the branch that has to do with sort of our history was the, the, uh, this 14th Street Church of Christ that then was later renamed Crossroads. And this was kind of what, uh, what described their ministry. Focus on one another, relationships, called them prayer partners, evangelistic small group Bible studies, and a plan for spreading to other campuses across the United States. This, 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 they had some great energy. And, um, you know, there's, there's people uh, today that we all know that were baptized in this church in, in, at Crossroads. Uh, Kip McKean was baptized at Crossroads. Sam Lang was already serving alongside Chuck at that time. Uh, some others converted at this time. Bruce Williams, Tom Brown, Wyndham Shaw, they're all part of what was growing out of these Crossroads campus ministries. In uh, 1975, Kip began to work at Northeastern Christian College outside of Philadelphia in, in the mainline church as a campus minister. And then in uh, 1976, Kip began to work with the Heritage Chapel Church of Christ in Charleston, Illinois. Uh, that's where Marty Fuquay became a Christian and became convinced that seminary was not the way to train ministers, but rather through discipling one minister walking with another. Okay, so th this is kind of what's leading up to us. Kip, in 1979, Kip met with the Lexington Church of Christ, implemented something new, the decision that every member, teen, student, single, married, and senior citizen would be totally committed. This made it different than simply being a campus ministry, uh, being attacked onto an already existing congregation. This was a call for complete commitment uh, at the level of every member. And already Crossroads Ministries were having some trouble because of the campus students graduating and uh, moving into the adult ministries, but taking with them the same standards of discipleship, et cetera, uh, was kind of a, a difficult time. And there was a number of uh, churches that divided over that. Um, Kip formulated a nine lesson study series, First Principles. And uh, I want, I'll show you in the next slide, this isn't something new per se, but uh, there was an emphasis in Kip's version which really put the emphasis on becoming a disciple. Interestingly, uh, 200 years ago in the Restoration Movement, becoming a disciple was the theme. They used that terminology, that, that's not new. And the call to repentance, if you read some of the things that were written uh, in the early Restoration Movement about repentance, you'd be impressed. Just what they required people to do to make sure they really had repented of their sins. So. Uh, what, what became a very significant equation for us, saved equals Christian equals disciple, understanding, of course, even from the next phrase, that it's a baptized disciple. Since uh, you have to become a disciple before you get baptized, obviously, saved equals Christian equals disciple doesn't quite work, but it equals baptized disciple. I think you'll see the logic in that. So there must be a decision to be a disciple before baptism. All other baptisms were invalid. I mean, here's the first principles. This was published in 1911 by a Church Christ minister in Australia. Here's the contents. 
the Bible, sin and its cure, Jesus Christ, his person, his office, two lessons on the Holy Spirit, faith, repentance, and confession, baptism, the church, its establishment and membership, the church, its worship and ministry. He, he had me, he had me till lesson 10. No instrumental music, but I won't go there, okay. Okay. So um, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to say that sometimes we think, didn't we make this? Isn't this our thing? I mean, I look at the Christian bookstores today, and, and I'm sad that we didn't write all the books in the discipleship section. Because in 1980, there was no discipleship section. Okay? Uh, and we were talking about it, and people, I was corrected all the time by people. That's not a verb. You can't say you disciple somebody. Uh, now, it is, okay? But anyways, um, uh, like I said in the beginning, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, the best we can do is to regain the same spirit that the apostles had of simply wanting to see the church uh, materialize in our generation. Uh, 1981, plan for p planting pillar churches, key cities. 1982, churches went out. Um, what time do I have to quit, just so I know? Uh, I think we have a 3 o'clock class. Or 3.30 class. No, 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock, okay, gotcha. So I think they put it all together. Okay, okay. So, um, so here we go. Uh, I'll just, I just, this is the history that you know. I just, I want to get to something. I, I'm getting to where I could have started, uh, but I actually wanted to talk about who we are as a movement. Um, we have seen some amazing things. And uh, this is available, this article, at, it's on Disciples Today as well, but you can find it right here at missionstory.com, which is my website. It's about the only thing that's up and running on that website right now, but it's there. Um, but this is a study that I put more than 2,000 hours into. Uh, it began as a, doc a doctorate project at the University of Birmingham. Uh, I had to step out of the project just because of ministry time constraints. But I, I went back and decided to finish it uh, uh, a, a year and a half ago just because I thought we, we needed to see it, okay? And uh, this, this is just... This is, I think, going to just, it just tells you, I think, a lot of ways, things that you already guessed. But here's the ICC membership annual growth. And if you were around, I mean, I visited Boston Church for the first World Missions Conference in 1982. In what we would call the Boston Movement, there were 626 people. It's pretty exciting to see that, if you were there. Okay? Uh, but, you know, uh, there's a story behind that, and that is... Uh, the blue line is the baptisms. The red line is the levers. Okay? Now, I'm using a different scale. Over there is the scale for membership. Over here is the scale for baptisms and levers. We baptized over 450,000 people in this period of time. But at the same period, we had almost 320,000 leave. Okay? Uh, now that, still when you look at that, we are growing, we're moving forward. And what happened, I believe, is we weren't really being critical enough of what was going on internally. Oh, there were some voices, and I don't mean to offend anybody as I talk about generalizations, right? But generally speaking, uh, well, I just asked this question, who was surprised by how bad things were in 2003? Was I the only one who was surprised about how bad things got in 2003? Oh, you weren't surprised? Who wasn't surprised how bad things were? Oh, okay. Who wasn't there at all and, and didn't care? Okay, okay, very good. Okay. Uh, I'm not trying to relive the past, but I, I, I wanted to go back and actually try to understand more clearly what actually took place. And rather than put the accumulative number of baptisms and accumulative deletions here I'm putting the, the uh, annual number. And see, what we actually see is that the peak in additions of our movement happened in 1998. That was the peak. We can already see some dips along the way. Now we can also see a problem, and that is that where there's kind of dips here, this is a little more steady. And so this would peak a year later. This decreased quickly, this decreased slowly. Now, if you look at this, 
This, this is just the facts of the stats. Wow. What's going to happen in 2003? Okay. This is what happens in 2003. That's, this is taking the years that were stats all the way here, 98 to 2002. That's hard stats. These are the projection lines, just basic mathematical projection. We were set to have a minus 9,000 membership in 2003 and a minus 19,000 in 2004 without any letter. Do you understand that? The letter, I mean, the letter itself, it's an, it's, the letter's an anomaly. Uh, I had that, uh, like ma many of us that were facing sort of some pretty feisty crowds back in 2003. Uh, I had someone ask me one time, uh, there was this forum group, I was a vis visiting in another church, and uh, someone at the back stood up holding this 50 pages and said, is this letter from God or from Satan? Great way to start the meeting. <laughs> and just because the way they said it, I remembered uh, something Jesus said. I said, Who's, whose signature's on it? <laughs> they, said, they said, Henry. I said, it's from Henry. <laughs> Amen. Okay, but I'm, I'm getting signaled. We got people coming in for another class. Uh, hopefully this is... T just whetted your appetite a little bit. I'm, I'm sorry I spent so much time in that history, but, but I want us to have a picture of who we are. And it isn't just about looking over the last 30 years. It's getting a place in the, in the whole story of Christianity. And also I believe that understanding this will help us in our evangelism. As we reach out to people who have a different story, we can find threads and commonality and begin a conversation. Amen. Thank you. Amen.